Good morning, everyone. Good morning. I'm so glad that someone found my reading glasses yesterday. <laughs> Um, uh, good morning, everyone. I've already introduced myself yesterday. Just to remind you, I'm Luis Santos, a professor from George Washington University. Uh, during the 2000 annual Paase, it's Paase not Paa. Just accepted. Uh, 2000 annual Paase meeting held at the Manila Shangri La Hotel in the Philippines. Dr. Severino Po. A co-founder of Paase initiated the Founders Lectureship Awards in Science and Engineering. The purpose of the award is to recognize the outstanding scientific and technological accomplishments of Paase members. A committee selects the recipient of the award from nominations submitted by Paase members. The awardee delivers a lecture at the, pa at the Paase annual meeting and is presented a plaque of recognition and a check of $1,000. Since its inception, we have had 21 awardees for science, including the chair of the 2023 Selection Committee, Arnel Salvador, of the UP National Institute of Physics, committee member Rosalia Seaman from University of Arkansas for Medical Sciences with, with us here today, uh, who was the awardee for 2022. Uh, this select group also includes uh, Giselle, who we just heard from today, uh, um, and of course, uh, Dr. Villalobos, uh, with her engaging uh, talk yesterday. Dr. Villalobos is, was here. <laughs> um, on the other hand, uh, there have been 15 awardees, awardees in the field of engineering. The most recent awardee was Dr. Elmer de Dios of DLSU in 2022. Um, I'm going to uh, divert a little bit, just speaking from the script. Uh, I was part of the selection committee, and when we were selecting the, the awardee for uh, engineering, I shut up. I told them I can't, uh, I can't include myself in the deliberation. So lo and behold, uh, they chose uh, uh, Anthony. And I remember uh, uh, Dr. Simon asking me, so who are you going to choose? <laughs> and of course, it's also Dr. Anthony to inform me, um, uh, whom I consider a close friend of mine as well. So um, to introduce the 16th member of this illustrious body, may I call on Paase former president and mass academician, Professor Alvin Kulaba, also a good friend of mine from BLSU to introduce the award. I just thank you. Hello to uh, Orlando from Manila. Uh, of course, I'm here. It's uh, evening here. It's actually oh, 9 14 oh. in the evening. Oh, yeah. And I know it's morning over there in uh, the East Coast. Uh, we are just adjusting the volume. Hello? Yes. Uh, can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, great. Again, hello uh, from Manila. Hello, Orlando. Uh, I'm missing a lot, uh, you know, from my absence over there. Uh, I wish I could join you in person, but nonetheless, I'm here virtually. Um, thank you, uh, Just, uh, for that uh, brief introduction. Thank you. I'm uh, honored to present our uh, 2023 uh, Severino and Co. Lectureship uh, Awardee in engineering, uh, which happens to be in Europe right now. He's actually in Vienna. So that's what technology is all about. I'm in Manila. Our uh, distinguished awardee is in Vienna in four hours time, flying to Amsterdam, I, I think, right? Uh, okay, but uh, uh, I would like to introduce uh, now uh, our uh, awardee for this year. He is one of our distinguished professors of industrial engineering at De La Salle University, a university fellow, research fellow, and professorial chair holder. He works in the areas of industrial and systems engineering, 
sustainable consumption and production, resource efficient and cleaner production, and eco-industrial development. A past president of the Asia Pacific Roundtable for Sustainable Consumption and Production, also uh, the Asia Pacific Industrial Engineering and Management Society, and secretary of the International Society of Industrial Ecology from 2010 to 2014. Currently, he serves as a secretary general of the International Foundation for Production Research and authored and co-authored nearly 200 development project manuscripts and index journal articles in these areas. Our awardee also serves in our Department of Environment and Natural Resources here in the Philippines as member of the Pollution Adjudication Board. He was a speaker at the Rio Plus 10 Science Forum and official delegate of the Philippine government in various UN summits, including the Rio Plus 20 uh, Sustainable Development Goal Roadmap and UNCRD 3R and Circular Economy Forum. He is a member of the UN International Resource Panel uh, from 2016 to 2023, the UNIDO UNEP RECP Net regional executive from 2013 to 2015, and UNIDO Green Industry Tec Technical Advisory Member and Advisory of Elsevier Atlas Sustainability Award, as well as a steering committee member of the Future Earth CAN on Systems of Sustainable Consumption and Production. A founding editor-in-chief, of the Journal of Cleaner and Responsible Consumption. Anthony, our recipient today, uh, is uh, the recipient of the 2018 Department of Science and Technology National Research Council of the Philippines Achievement Award, 2020 DOSC National Academy of Science and Technology Environmental Science Award, 2022 PhilaAST Michael Purvis Award for Sustainability Research, uh, the 2023 Philippine Federation of Professional Association Distinction Awardee and 2023 Philippine American Academy of Science and Engineering Severino and Pasco Lectureship Award in Engineering. Just uh, about a few weeks ago, our brother president of Del Sal University has appointed him as the Presidential Advisor on Sustainability. Ladies and gentlemen, it is my distinct honor and pleasure to introduce our 2023 Severino and, co uh, and Pass Co-Lectureship Award in Engineering recipient, ladies and gentlemen, Professor Dr. Anthony Xunfung Chu. Anthony. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, maraming salamat, Alvin. Uh, can you hear me from the venue? I can hear you from Manila. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, unang una, um, good morning to our colleagues in Orlando. Uh, good evening to our colleagues in Manila. And I am speaking now at 3.20 in, uh, in Vienna. Uh, I'm, I regret that I cannot uh, physically uh, attend the uh, Orlando events uh, uh, due to some visa problem. Uh, uh, I cannot get the appointment, an earlier appointment. Uh, see my PowerPoint now. I will do it. I will make it the slide mode. Yes. Is it visible? Okay. I will try to remove my uh, uh, some smaller screens. No? All right. Uh, I think I have around 30 to 40 minutes. Am I right? Okay. Thank you. So, uh, 30 minutes, no? 30 or 45? Sorry. Yes. 30. Oh, 30. Okay, thank you. So I, uh, I'll try to make it quick. Uh, I, I would like to share with you uh, my pathway of uh, going into this uh, research topic uh, since 1990s. Uh, from my very uh, first project collaboration 
with uh, Dr. Antonio Alcantara no, of UP Los Baños, CESAM. The topic of my presentation is on SDG 12 and eco-industrial development towards circular economy. Okay, uh, what I will present first, a uh, part of my data are obtained uh, from the publication we published for, through the United Nations Environment International Resource Panel. Uh, we are now producing every four years a uh, uh, global resource outlook. Uh, a synopsis of the 21st century on environmental outlook says 60% uh, of ecosystem already degraded, increasing uh, threat from the, uh, from the uh, greenhouse gas emission and soil degradation as well as uh, air pollution issues. But more than that, uh, while we go into urbanization, uh, around 50% of the urban fabric expected to exist by 2050. What does this mean? The data shows that we are about to develop further half a million square kilometers of built up uh, urban area uh, by that time. And if we are not efficient enough to make use of our resources, uh, it will end up not only through the material use, but also the uh, demand for energy and water into the urban area, uh, like what we had uh, data from 2011 to 2013, China alone, has used up more cement than the entire United States during the entire 20th century. Uh, the SDG number 12, which is on responsible uh, consumption and production, actually has cut across uh, several other issues. Since it is a system approach, we have the input of uh, raw material and the output in the form of uh, finished product and services, as well as uh, unwanted output such as pollu pollutants. And pollutants usually are classified into uh, solid waste, uh, air pollution, and also wastewater and other liquid waste. Therefore, if we will look at the uh, other SDG, I think there are more than nine other SDG directly connected to how we go into a more sustainable pattern of consumption and production, uh, not only dealing with cities, not only dealing with industrialization, but also on fishery, uh, climate change, and uh, other issues. Therefore, we believe that the uh, sustainable pattern of consumption and production is the most efficient strategy to avoid a trade-off and create synergies to resolve the development and environmental challenges. For these, uh, the United Nations Environment International Resource Panel has published uh, earlier the resource efficiency uh, uh, technical reports. They are not; uh, they are uh, readily uh, downloadable uh, in the UN uh, website. And as I mentioned, I part I joined part of the uh, co-author the very first uh, inaugural uh, issue of the global material uh, of the global material uh, outlook uh, first issue. In those uh, early versions, we came up with several conclusions, and I would like to highlight three. First one, uh, these three we have in the La Salle University research teams have uh, further investigated through our own uh, research uh, activities. What happened here is the first one is that consumption has a stronger driver of growth in material demand than population growth. So we are using the I equal PAT equation where in impact is correlated to pollution, uh, population affluence and technology. Second, uh, since year 2000, material efficiency has declined, meaning that uh, we now need more demand of raw material or resources input in order to generate dollar GDP. And the last one, the richest countries consume on an average 10 times more materials than the poorest uh, using material footprint uh, 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 approaches uh, compared to around 20 or 30 years ago, we only have the foot, uh, ecological footprint. Now we have material footprint, we have water footprint, and we have uh, also carbon footprint as our tools. So coming to the, uh, to the data, we have data covering 40 years of uh, material consumption, uh, covering 192 countries work globally. And uh, using material flow accounting, we classify them into four, four categories. And we can see over the past uh, decade, the demand for non-metallic minerals has grown. Uh, these are mainly the gravel and sand, uh, especially used in the infrastructure. Uh, Asia Pacific, uh, among the different regions of the world, has the highest accelerated demand 
for these uh, resources. If we will look at the I equal PAT equation and using a logarithmic mean division, uh, division method, uh, what we found out that uh, the orange, uh, the second one, which is the Asia and Pacific oh, during the last 10 years, uh, has the affluence or the way we consume a consumption pattern has uh, beat up the has beaten up the population driving factors as well as the technological driving factors. Well, unfortunately, it's quite unfortunate that technology is supposed to be there to reduce the demand uh, because of the technological uh, advance adv advances. Uh, we should bring down the uh, demand for resources. But uh, in Asia Pacific and also in West Asia, as you can see in these two, uh, two regions, uh, the technology contributes positively to the demand for resources, uh, which we have another article uh, writing about that. And I will be discussing that briefly later. A uh, global economy also need uh, more material per unit of GDP. If I remember right, for every dollar GDP in the past, we need about 3.4 kilogram of natural resources. Now we are getting, uh, we are uh, inputting more, I think uh, around 4.1 kilogram in order to generate one GDP dollar globally at the global average. So in order to achieve the sustainable future, uh, the, the framework that the uh, head of states have agreed is a decoupling or decouple from the uh, resource use, the environmental impact from the economic growth. And how to achieve that, uh, we have uh, introduced several uh, methods. One of the uh, known me or the uh, popular methods now is the LM Outdoors uh, introduction of the circular economy. But from a system point of view, we have earlier uh, the basic uh, theory thinking that industrial ecology with a linear system is not sustainable. And we are moving uh, from extraction linearly until disposal wherein resources are thought to be unlimited from the, uh, from, from the planet. And we also think that planet Earth has unlimited uh, carrying capacity or digestive uh, capacity, which was wrong. So over the years, we have been working hard on that, trying to do more recycle, retaining materials and uh, resources within the hu uh, human system, economic system, and uh, emitting limited waste to the, to the planet. But uh, this is still uh, just delaying the case. As I chair one of the circular economy uh, forum in Chatham House in London a few years ago, uh, we find out that the recycling rate in uh, even in the top uh, economies such as Switzerland and Japan are still far from ideal. Uh, of course, the ideal uh, sustainable stage is where in all uh, resources are in the closed loop and the only energy that we'll get into our system are the solar energy uh, from the outer space. Uh, however, we, have, uh, we are still very far from this technological uh, dream. In order to assess the situation of each countries or each economies, uh, the ecological economist or the industrial ecology, uh, ecologist we adopted the uh, material flow accounting um, toolbox, wherein we will uh, we have a simple uh, 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 balancing equation. And uh, back in year 2000, my colleague uh, Marina Fischer Kowalski from uh, Austria uh, presented the decoupling uh, situation in many OECD countries. As you can see, the dark line is the GDP, while the consumption of natural resources and also the emission impact has uh, decoupled uh, relatively or partially from the, uh, from the economic growth, meaning that for every GDP produced, they are using less and less uh, resources, which is a partial decoupling uh, scenario. Uh, so what we did in 2011, uh, uh, through the project uh, funded by uh, Korea and WWF, we presented to the Philippine uh, cabinet cluster this, uh, the scenario of the Philippines. Uh, using 40 years data, if I remember that time, including uh, a colleague, uh, uh, doc, uh, Dr. Rapera from UP Los Baños, uh, we, we came up with this data and, um, and find out that the Philippine situation has a GDP and natural resources uh, overlapping each other, meaning that every uh, kilogram of natural resources has been successfully converted into GDP. However, this is not good enough because 
for a sustainable future, we need to have them at least partial decoupled, meaning that we need to produce more GDP with less natural resources. These were uh, uh, published uh, by uh, uh, DNR and UNEP in that uh, year, 2011. Uh, after those years, we continue to, uh, my, my research team in the La Salle University, we continue working with global uh, part, uh, research teams. We publish a paper in PNAS on the studying 27 uh, megacities worldwide, looking at the uh, driving uh, factors on the consumption of energy and uh, resources in megacities. Uh, we also use the LMDI uh, method to look at the uh, different sectors in, uh, in the Philippines using some of our uh, master and PhD students. And uh, we continue working on that, uh, on the inner, uh, transportation sector. And also this one, we collaborated with EPFL in Lausanne in Switzerland. Uh, this one, we try to analyze and go beyond Philippines and study some uh, uh, five countries, if I correctly uh, remember, because I call them the tiger and the cubs, uh, uh, strong economies in, a, in the ASEAN. Uh, currently, we are now studying all the 10 countries in ASEAN, and hopefully we will publish that this year. And the last one, I think here, uh, also, yeah, this is the one with uh, Dr. Corazon Rapera of UP Los Baños uh, that we cover uh, 28 years or nearly 30 years of data of the Philippines. Uh, what does MFA also tell us? Because if we will just take the GDP out and also from the uh, emission in terms of uh, a gaseous emission, we can easily realize, for example, this is presented by the Chinese Academy of Science in 2005 by Professor Ken Yong. Japan uh, emission uh, in socks and NOx is relatively 54 times less than China, meaning that for every GDP produced or generated in China, the people or the constituents, they are suffering 54 times more from the air pollutions uh, they breathe in, especially in uh, Beijing that time. Also, we see the data here from MFA. We can also see that in China, uh, from a uh, indicator of uh, index of one using Japan uh, as, uh, in, as the index, China is consuming 11.5 times more energy for every dollar they gain. So similarly, we are trying to do the same thing for the Philippines in our uh, research publication this year or next year. And my research team, I'm very grateful. I'm working with uh, Palawan's uh, Council for Sustainability, Dr. Uh, Marian Faith uh, Perez, who just came back to the Philippines after her PhD study in Nagoya University. So our aim is to do, is to close the loop and in order to close the loop, we are trying to use circular economy and other methods. And one of them is eco-industrial uh, development, which is uh, in the headline, uh, in the title of my presentation today. So as an industrial engineer, we use a system approach wherein uh, uh, we look first at the industrial estate or industrial park as the smallest or meso, meso level and little by little we move up into a city boundary and a country boundary and this has uh, uh, been studied in around 22 countries and uh, that started with my first very first project in uh, a board of investment with Dr. Alcantara which I mentioned earlier. So I uh, author a, a manual on how to connect uh, such uh, a clean production uh, approaches in industrial estate in the CP environmental management industrial estate panel in 2004. Uh, and clean production uh, is a very simple approach. It is a preventative approach or, or uh, we think that uh, prevention is better than cure. If we will have uh, 80 units produced from 100 units of input, we produce 20 units waste. If we can prevent the waste generation by uh, reprocessing or re-engineering the process, which is the main job of the industrial engineer, we can produce more. Therefore, we increase our GDP. Another important, uh, that is efficiency. But another important notion here is that if we need only 80 units of products, we should only extract 90 units of input so that more resources will be left for the future generation, which is sufficiency concept. And uh, we try first uh, at the beginning to look at only factories and then supply chain, 
but this is not enough to create a zero sum or a zero emission approach. And therefore we look at the uh, ways of one factory can become input to another factory within a industrial park. So this is the industrial symbiosis approach, which was uh, uh, nearly documented sometime in back in 1990s. We applied that in several uh, industrial estates in the Philippines. I remember there are four, uh, three in Laguna and one in uh, Bataan. And uh, we also tried to look at city level. And this was a project in uh, Hoi An City in UNESCO heritage of uh, uh, site in, uh, in Vietnam. So we do the same kind of approach wherein ways of one uh, sector can be used as a input to another sector. Uh, this is the documentation in the early 1990s where in Board City evolved into a, a, a very uh, successful and efficient exchange of resources, uh, exchange of waste, exchange of water, and also energy cascading, uh, which I documented further in 2004 and earlier done by EPFL of uh, Switzerland. Uh, from those experience, I developed a model that is better fit for the Philippines or for Asia Pacific, wherein I, uh, I, I categorize them into primary and supportive using Michael Porter's approach, uh, value chain, and we have uh, uh, more discussion and details I published in 2001 in our own journal, the Journal of Industrial Ecology. Uh, Jap the Korean government adopted uh, and some other government adopted my approach and also transformed into their own uh, interpretation. And this is a good interpretation of Eco-Industrial Park in Korea funded by their own government uh, under the Ministry of uh, Trade and Industry. Uh, details were discussed on how uh, different companies in, the, uh, in South Korea uh, exchange uh, their resources. Now, the very difference here is that most of the companies in South Korea are Korean companies. While many companies in our industrial park in the Philippines are multinationals and uh, from uh, Japan, Korea, and uh, some OECD countries. So cooperation is not uh, as easy as uh, happening in uh, Europe, US, Japan, or in Korea. So this one was uh, collaborated with the University of Ulsan and I also developed a four stage uh, continuum uh, process on how individual, how industrial symbiosis can start from individual uh, factory until it can serve as a server or provider of uh, technology to the uh, standalone industry outside the industrial park, as well as the community or the local uh, LGU. So this was also uh, coordinated with the uh, UNS Cup in, uh, in, in Bangkok. Uh, when I returned uh, to the academe, we tried to work on uh, different uncertainties, and therefore we worked with uh, Malaysia, with uh, Professor uh, Academician Raymond Tan, uh, on game theory, on uh, our master degree student, we published on um, uh, multiple integer uh, linear programming model for energy using energy memory in the uh, in the system. Uh, those we published using MRG and uh, our past president of PASEC, uh, Kea Viso also uh, evolved using PGRAPH branch and bound method on uh, optimization modeling of this, uh, of this industrial symbiosis or eco industrial development um, approaches. So these were uh, some of the new, uh, some of the uh, development we did uh, from 1990s to uh, 2010. Uh, using various optimization modeling and uh, some uh, hypothetical uh, data. So these are the energy uh, con uh, uh, con uh, conversion factors we use in our, uh, also our optimization in the master degree uh, thesis in De La Salle University. However, how, no matter, we work very, very well in the production side, uh, that was quite not enough. Therefore, uh, we need also policy support market forces uh, on top of the technological innovation. And on the other side, we also need consumption uh, cooperation using life cycle uh, perspe perspective. And in, from 2000 to 2010, we, we uh, look at uh, the demand side, which is more on the consumption. And I involve uh, biologists in my team wherein we look at mesolimbic dopaminergic reward system and 
uh, how human really are not satisfied with the needs and we go further into wants and desire. And therefore we try to use some social science method to, is to investigate the consumption pattern of uh, local communities of certain populations. And this uh, evolved uh, working relationship with the School of Management and uh, the uh, Service Management Program of Industry Engineering here in De La Salle University. So we publish a lot with, uh, with uh, our alumni uh, from Taiwan who, start pick, uh, who did his master and PhD in De La Salle University. And uh, recently, uh, I, uh, in, I, I, I am the founding uh, editor in chief of this uh, clean and responsible consumption journal. And uh, together with my DBA student, Jonah and uh, Kea Viso and Raymond Tan, we uh, put some remarks and uh, short uh, communications on uh, consumption patterns. So these are one. These are some of the more recent uh, articles published in 2020 to 2023. Uh, consumption is really a difficult issue to look at because social science is not enough. It only can uh, document what is the um, what is the current stage of a certain group of people. Uh, behave, uh, consumption behavior. And therefore, I believe production and consumption, which are side, uh, two sides of the same coin, should be further investigated and a uh, big area of research potential. Uh, with that, thank you very much. I hope I didn't go beyond 30 minutes. Thanks, Anthony. Anthony, for the engaging and impactful. Uh, talk on a very important issue. Um, what's the strategy here? So, and I mean, uh, should people come closer to the mic? So, yes. Okay. So, uh, let, let me now ask uh, people here, Anthony, uh, for questions. By the way, I think I saw Anna. Congratulations to Anna. <laughs> So let, let us now uh, start the questions. Any questions from the panel? Let me start with Frank. Uh, do you want to okay, can you hear? Can you hear Frank? Uh, my question yeah, is... I, I can hear Jews, but I cannot hear very well from the other. Uh... It's about microphone, though. Ah, this one I can hear. I think it's that uh, Doc Giselle speaking. Just a quick question. <laughs> okay, uh, I'm Frank Simmons from the University of Arkansas Medical School. Quick question. Uh, in your experience, have we got anywhere near the maximum, the theoretical maximum in terms of recycling, or can we, can we still go much further in that regard? Thank you. Thank you very much. I think for recycling, there are uh, push and pull. Uh, the push part is the behavior of the consumer. As when we also talk, we are also referring to producer as a consumer of raw material. So we are not talking about consumer, the end consumer of uh, end product. And the pull side is the infrastructure or mechanism that is provided by the government. If the pusher or the people who are willing to to recycle, like what we are doing here in the Philippines, we are segregating our waste. However, when it comes to certain stage, I think they were remixed in some uh, local communities. So uh, the push and the pull should uh, really uh, coincide together and synchronize, or else uh, the effort from the uh, originators uh, okay, may not receive uh, a full efficiency in the entire system. Uh, we still, I think we are still uh, lacking uh, very much the infrastructure for recycling uh, in our in in many part of our LGUs. Thank you. And I think I saw Mario raising his hand. Hi, Anthony, uh, Doctor uh, Anthony Shun uh, Congratulations for this. Uh, well <laughs> I, there are two points in your presentation and I got very excited. One is when you said that you're using social science methodology, you know, in, in uh, your work. And number two, I saw the model where uh, one of the outcomes is happiness. 
right? <laughs> I, I, I was really, I got curious about how you measured happiness because I'm very familiar with the literature of, on happiness. There are <laughs> correlates of happiness. One is numbers, number of hours of sleep, you know? It's been found that the eight hours, you know? The, the people who sleep uh, for eight hours are the happiest. But nine, it's, it, 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 uh, it's not as, you know, as, as high as, as uh, uh, eight hours. Number two, physical activities. You know, exercise or other kinds of physical activities. Number three uh, would be uh, mindfulness, meditation, yoga, prayers. Number four uh, is uh, uh, gratefulness, and number five is kindness. So, but I'm really curious. Like, how do you uh, uh, measure happiness in this instance? You know, or uh, have you applied any of the social science uh, uh, measures uh, or indicators of happiness? Thank you. Uh Thank you very much. Actually, in our uh, research studies, in the social science research studies, the parameters or the indicators we're using mainly coming from first the literature review so that we will not introduce uh, new parameters. But of course, one of the happiness index is introduced by Bhutan. So we are using happiness uh, introduced by uh, some authorities. Uh, and unfortunately, uh, the the well-being that is the uh, so we when we talk about the sustainable development we have the social the environment uh, the ecological and the economic so that goes to the more the well-roundedness the well-being of uh, the, the the lifestyle and also the, uh, the the quality of life so uh, when it comes to that it is very subjective uh, we are uh, we are also very much pondering about how people are satisfied. And that's why the consumption pattern is getting more and more unsustainable. Uh, we noticed the uh, techno technology is also contributing to higher demand of uh, higher demand of what? Of, uh, of resources. For example, we thought that if a air conditioner with a higher um, a thermal efficiency should bring down the energy demand. However, we notice now that uh, because of the happiness, people are getting happier. Uh, easier to acqu uh, to acquire like a, in the past if you want to drink a cup of coffee you have to go down and go to Starbucks nearby but now with just in the app technology technology advancement uh, you can easily order a lot of uh, single items uh, and 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 that I believe is one reason uh, a happiness can also lead to higher demand so we need to see how well being can be uh, can lead to more sustainability instead of uh, well-being and happiness or happiness leads to unsustainability. So that may be uh, an, an indirect issues that we need also to address in the future. So social science, uh, uh, social science tools, we very much use survey and questionnaires, uh, pairwise uh, analysis using AHP, AMP, uh, FASI, Dematel, so that we will be more accurately capture the responses of our uh, of our respondents in our studies, but as again I said the social science uh, studies we did has very limited impact uh, because if we study a certain group of population in this uh, region, uh, the results can only uh, represent uh, the the behavior or the attitude of this group of people, and that is very helpful in marketing uh, marketing strategy of uh, corporate marketing strategy, but may not be very helpful in the study of sustainable consumption. That's why we are still looking for better uh, better tools in the future. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. So while waiting for the next question, let me make a, a quick commentary as a moderator. Um, Mario said that uh, one of the facets of happiness is uh, sleep, and um, I would say that Giselle is an exception. I, 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 I heard you. I heard you use a word that I love in that topic of uh, and she Giselle doesn't sleep. But every time I would see Giselle, she's always happy. <laughs> anyway, uh, uh, what questions? No more. Uh, Giselle, so now Giselle has a question for you. Where are you So, um, Anthony, it's so uh, great to uh, see you so cheerful in your research. Very, very inspiring. So you talked about a material uh, uh, cost as four point, um, 
four grams now of natural resource uh, for uh, a unit of GDP, right? And uh, it's growing. Um, but what about the energy cost? As a chemist, I always think in terms of matter and energy. Okay, so uh, then you mentioned uh, solar as the ultimate, uh, I think, ultimate free energy that you should uh, harness or harvest. So uh, in the industrial setting in the Philippines, how are the uh, uh, local and uh, multinational industries coping with the highest energy cost uh, in uh, Southeast Asia, in the Philippines? Is this true? that we have the highest energy cost. How can we attract more foreign uh, direct investments with this high energy cost? Thank you, uh, thank you very much, Your Excellency. Uh, 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 your Excellency as the immediate past president of PAASE. Uh, <laughs> okay. Uh, let, let um, may, may I clarify first? Uh, uh, in the material flow accounting, when we talk about energy, they we are talk, looking at the energy carriers. So energy carrier in cold, including coals, etc. Now, uh, when I talk about the solar energy a while ago, it was more of a planetary boundary, and therefore uh, we all the all the life for, uh, well from from my understanding everything all life starts from photosynthesis and everything uh, that comes from outside the system boundary is the solar is the solar source and when the solar source come into the system it generates you not know, different kind of other uh, energy carriers that includes uh, uh, ocean wave it includes weather uh, weather changes so that include that will create wind energy and wind power. So uh, I'm not I'm not using I'm, I'm I'm not saying that solar energy is the ultimate uh, uh, ultimate uh, renewable energy or ultimate sustainable form of energy. So when uh, solar energy comes to our planet, uh, the MRG study, the E M E R G Y. The letter M stands for memory, so it has a transformation indicate uh, transformation factor, transforming from uh, solar energy into photosynthesis and into human activities. And those were uh, were were earlier studies, and we we are using that in the energy uh, field. So uh, either solar energy will be directly used as a source of renewable energy or or wind and wind power, uh, ocean power, uh, including geothermal energy as renewable sources, uh, that is also caused you know, by our uh, by our solar input, you no know, solar energy input, uh, were were a, a were, was a very different or a special discipline uh, that is going beyond our discipline. But I believe that they can be interconnected and our. Uh, our methodology would be very helpful in the entire system analysis. Uh, the latest ASEAN report, uh, if I may, if I if I remember right, I think that was year 2000 or 2000, uh, 2020, uh, indicated that ASEAN economies are still very much focusing on the coal and non-renewable energy because of the economic uh, issue. So uh, uh, that that is a sad such story. However, uh, we had a recent uh, meeting in uh, Bangkok uh, on the International Resource Panel, and I, this is a very important issue I would like to share with you. Uh, what happened here is that in order to achieve 1.5 degree uh, limit, uh, the, whole, the whole world has, uh, has gone out of all its way to do whatever we can to uh, to find resource uh, to find energy resources, and one of the approaches is electric ele electricity, electrical electric electrical cars or electric vehicles. Uh, the the concern of the international resource panel in our meeting in Bangkok is that uh, the electric vehicle may the system of electric vehicle may bring down the uh, the uh, the global. Uh, cli uh, greenhouse gas emission on one hand. However, uh, the materials or the resources needed to build the, uh, uh, the electric vehicle, the battery of the electric ve vehicle, and the infrastructure of the electricity providing a provision, okay, 
uh, if you will look at from a life cycle point of view, the extraction of rare metal or rare mineral in order to go into the resource, uh, the, 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 the batteries and mm -hmm. other parts of the electric vehicle may, may, um, may upset the greenhouse gas emission that was, uh, that was reduced by the intention of shifting from fossil fuel into electric vehicle uh, uh, initiatives. Therefore, uh, the, the International Resource Panel has uh, initiated a, a working group to look into that and hopefully we would come up with all the data as soon as possible because we have involved people in the miner in the mining industry uh, in the energy sector battery etc so uh, there is no uh, there is no there, I, I believe there is no uh, accurate answer yet now what is the best approach although we definitely no renewable energy is the correct pathway. Uh, redu reduction, use, reduced use of fossil fuel should be, uh, should be retained, but uh, we should be very careful in shifting to any other form of renewable energy uh, because there are still a very big area of uncertainty, especially on the material that goes into those systems. We should not only look at the uh, the uh, the carrier alone, the, for example, electric car, then we should not only look at the car alone or the consumption of the uh, 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 the consumption of electricity, uh, the, the consumption stage of the electric car, but we should look at the life cycle from the extraction of raw material that goes into the production of a car that goes into all other elements of infrastructure needed in the entire system. So uh, that is a... Uh, uh, there is no certainty answer yet, but uh, multinational companies are still very active in our country, especially in the mining sector. My personal, uh, my personal concern here is that uh, we have not benefited much from the mining activities in the country. I, my, my feeling or my involvement in the Pollution Adjudication Board of DNR for the last past 20 years, in my opinion, is that Although the mining activity promised a lot of uh, labor or uh, job opportunities, but I don't think it brings enough uh, well-being uh, uh, benefits to the local community. It has not also brought enough um, uh, financial, uh, financial or monetary benefits to our country in terms of taxes. And it has not, especially it has not brought enough capacity and capability building to our country. We yeah. must be independent. We must be growing from a technology zero to a uh, relatively higher technological level in processing our own mineral and not relying always on international or ODA or, or on the overseas uh, development assistance. Thank you very much. Any more questions? I do have one. Uh, Lulu from Lulu. Because I do I have to be here? Yeah, yeah okay. the microphone is. Take one. I will have to look at myself. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I'm sorry. No, it doesn't look good. But anyway, I don't like this. Oh, this is better. Okay, I am uh, Giselle uh, Conception's uh, campaign manager. <laughs> no, no, no. I, I, I'm serious about this, okay? Uh, because Mario, a sociologist, mentioned yeah, about sure. happiness. Sociologist. Oh, oh, oh. Social psychology. <laughs> Whatever. Okay. <laughs> they all, they're all the same. Uh, I, I mean, I want to uh, quote somebody. You know, everybody knows Seville de Terra Wadley. Yeah. She made a very curious comment when our. Um, whatever, sociologist, psychologist, Social or psycho lady, psycho guy here, <laughs> said something about what motivates, uh, how can we motivate student, uh, people in the Philippines to embrace STEM or STEAM or whatever. And four people, uh, the four speakers give comments from role models, economic significance, blah, 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 blah. But Seville has to have something different and she said, the reason why students uh, do not go for science is because they're too happy. 
Yeah, they need a level of discontent in the Philippines. Filipinos are too content, are too content. I'm again, it's counterintuitive. I'm sorry, Mario. But but it's, but in uh, I mean in education in education psychology you heard of Piaget you need this equilibrium for people to learn and I thought so in life I think you need that spark we can debate this over and over again I just want to quote this curious comment from Seville of course she also said they have to be curious and to be curious there should be some kind of dis dissatisfaction. And we're too happy. So I, I'm in a dilemma. Should I make them go to STEM and be rich or whatever? Because, uh, I mean, sometimes, uh, I don't know. I really don't know anything. So it goes back to you. Yes, uh, so thank you, chemicalist. <laughs> 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 understand Sibyl, she's more focused on curiosity rather than the affect actually. She was saying that uh, probably we need to develop more curiosity among our uh, children from, from, from the very start. And that's why, you know, we have the learning poverty. But I, I think that there's a lot of structural elements, structural factors that we need to focus on too. It's because we have uh, not only learning poverty, but poverty itself. No, that's what hunger, uh, that's what Father Nebras uh, was really focused, uh, is really focused on. You know, I mean, the now in the Israel, we have seen a lot of that. So they should go together, a comprehensive model of how we will move forward our, our system of training and educating our young children to be curious enough to be scientists. And that's why we are uh, starting as uh, programs, uh, you know, that are more collaborative, more uh, uh, communitarian, that will not so much uh, uh, emphasize competition. Competition is important, you know, but we need to have enough infrastructure uh, uh, to be able to really move, uh, 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 I'm not even talking about test scores, you know, but you know, uh, a lot of, there's a lot of indices of our uh, learning, uh, and 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 uh, uh, we should really be serious about this. So, so I I know I know I I'm just like taken aback by the uh, by the uh, comment that they're uh, uh, too happy, you know. But probably you know uh, uh, we are just uh, like, we should discuss about it. Yeah. <laughs> no, no, no. Okay. No, 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 no. No, no, no. no here's, here's the thing. Mario is going to be the next governor of here. <laughs> 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 okay, but anyway, here's the thing. I'm giving a talk this afternoon <laughs> together with Oli. Uh, you know, it's a foundation. Everybody should attend. <laughs> it's, too, it's too bad. I mean, <laughs> hello, <laughs> Ms. Rogers. <laughs> you will be absent, okay? I know that. But please, please, I like your idea, but there's a simpler one, and I will talk about that. Okay. Yeah, 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 it will be rewarded, okay? Okay. Yeah. And also, Dr. Sue. <laughs> <laughs> Anthony, Anthony, Anthony. Oh my God. I want you to I want you to listen because it's all about community effort and volunteerism. All right? We need you in that program. Yes. So, <laughs> may, may, may I may I comment also? Choose with it, Baba. I, I think happiness is not an inhibitor, no? It's not an inhibiting factor to progress. Uh, although we are saying we're always happy, pero if we will look at the global happiness index, I think mga countries that have the highest uh, happiness index are in the Scandinavia. And I think yeah. the development index are also equally high. So I think there are other parameters. So it is a partial, kumbaka sa calculate partial differentiation ng to. Meron pa ibang factors that we should look into. And I think uh, finding the gap between a certain target and a certain uh, current status. 
must be developed and established so that people will be having some good target to uh, to work on based on their curiosity and etc so every uh, scientist every scientific discipline has a important role to play in a system thank you yeah, I, I heard that uh, Copenhagen consistently ranks as uh, one of the happiest cities in the world. And here in Orlando, we're uh, sitting like right uh, where, where Disney World, the happiest place in the world as well. So, <laughs> so I have a question. So uh, we have a question from uh, Ed. Thank you for your talk. Enjoy that. But uh, I wanted to comment about uh, this is kind of related to this issue of happiness in the, the Philippines in general. Because I'm in the mathematical sciences. Uh, we always ask questions. Uh, if a Giselle says something, I say, is that really true? But, now, for a lot of Filipinos, that question is not a very good question. Is it really true? Because it's as if you're attacking the person. But that is the essence of curiosity. If you start asking questions like, are you really saying what you are saying is true? Then, then that's where it starts. You want to understand. It's nothing against the person, but it is being discovered into understand. But I think that is something that the Filipinos in general kind of miss. We are so happy to try to offend somebody. But offending is not offending. It's more towards understanding. And that goes to your question, I think. I have sense that uh, people are, uh, to us, asking questions, it, it, it's offending people. But science is not like that. Mathematics is not like that. We are very uh, asking, we are saying, prove it to me before I believe you. That's the whole essence of it. And I'm sure that the engineer there uh, understands this and uh, just understands this issue. So, so uh, my, what I'm saying is that as Filipinos, for us that comes into understand, let us not be shy in trying to confirm in quotation marks somebody. He asks, is that really true? Prove it. Yeah. Uh, thanks, Ed. Um, I also have a burning question, and I think I have time. Um, I, I think um, I'd like to take this opportunity because Giselle is also here representing National Innovation Center. So I saw one of the slides, if I read it correctly, the, the research input to finished product output at the gold standard is Japan, followed by Italy, which is 1.22. So I'd like to hear from Anthony, like what are the best practices that are practical enough and can be adopted by the Philippines, uh, knowing that Giselle is here. And she's listening. <laughs> and, and, uh, no, no, she's listening as a representative of the National Innovation Center. And potentially the future nurse. And a fear shop, sorry. Yeah. Yeah, two, uh, two representatives from NIC, that uh, Dr. Pierce or Rockville from Batangas State University. Oh, oh, first of all, congratulations, ulit, no, sa ating talawang paase members who are now uh, appointed or uh, appointed to the to the national innovation and uh, uh, the, the 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 table that I, I share with you was uh was based on a MFA study and then from the MFA study the data can be uh can be extracted based on the in uh based on the input which is on the energy carrier that's why when those data were extracted and uh converting Japan uh. Japan data equal to one, index of one, then you can get the equivalent uh, or corresponding ratio. And the purpose of that table was to show how much uh, more inefficient, not the system of other economic system of other economies uh, compared to Japan. And in that case, if I remember, China is 11.2. Then that was year 2001. Now that goes to the happiness and self complacency, uh, complacency issue. Uh, I think uh, in back in two thousand one or two thousand four, the data sh the table showed uh, give a presented a gap. So it is important that it is science, evidence, scientifically computed, evidence based, data driven, and therefore there is a gap shown to the public that in China, our uh, their uh, their energy 
efficiency is 11.2 more inefficient compared to Japan. And this can get this can result uh, this can be a reason for poorer infrastructure, uh, especially like our food system in the Philippines from the farm to the uh, to the plate. And and uh, and it may also involve not only the primary industry but also the secondary, which is the manufacturing, and then the third tertiary industry, which is the service industry. So all these uh, industry or econ uh, industry added together in the supply or the value chain will contribute not to those discrepancies. Now, why Japan is one and the other is 11.2. Now, what is the situation in the Philippines? We don't have the data at, at, at that year, 2001. Now, you were asking me, what are the best practices? Uh, in the part of the secondary industry, which is more on the production and manufacturing, where I belong, industrial engineering, uh, we, we did, uh, the Philippines or the entire Asia Pacific did receive a lot of ODA and other financial grants of technical, or we call it uh, uh, technical assistance of ADB. For example, uh, many projects uh, under were, were, were carried out and all these uh, success factors, success stories were properly documented. Now in the area of sustainable production and consumption, uh, I had in, 20, in year 2020, I documented 90, 90 or 99 uh, cases from uh, that were projects supported by European Union. And uh, I think some of them from UN website and maybe there are few from the ADB uh, websites. So those were uh, best practices that we can look at uh, for the developing economies. However, not all uh, technologies or approach or techniques are appropriate for every country. So again, appropriate technology is another important assessment capability of country of 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 country government in before prior to accepting any uh, any grants or support from a foreign country. They must make sure that they understand how to assess a technology to be uh, transferred from country A to receiving country is appropriate or not. So uh, best practices are easy to say, but uh, identifying which technology is best for our, our scenario, for our national scenario, for a local government scenario can be very different picture. So uh, more people in the STEM or STEAM area would be very helpful in the future or continuous development of our country. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Anthony. Uh, before we call the um, the past representatives, I just uh, for the photo and uh, official um, awarding, I just like to make sure that there are no questions in inadvertently ignored from the virtual participants, because I'm seeing uh, for chats there. No, no questions. Okay, so um, this is the moment, uh, the moment in time where I'd like to request um, His Excellency Governor <laughs> President uh, Mariano uh, Mario, um, VP Gladys. Uh, it says here VP, but uh, immediate past president and uh, potentially future president, uh, Dr. Senya Tigno and uh, Lisa Pirata. To come in front to award the trophy and check to Anthony. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, uh, Juice, can you uh, receive the oh, yeah. award? <laughs> <in> the <laughs> so, on behalf of uh, the Philippine American Academy of Science and Engineering, and of course the selection committee headed by uh, Dr. Arnel uh, uh, Salvador, Dr. Susan uh, Yasmel, and uh, Dr. Juice Santos, we award this. Uh, uh, trophy to uh, uh, Dr. Anthony uh, Xiong Pung Chu for being the 2023 Severino and Pasco Lectureship Awardee in Engineering. And let me just read uh, uh, the citation for him. So Dr. Uh, Anthony uh, Xiong Pung Chu is recognized as the distinguished recipient of the Co uh, Award for Engineering in 2023. Through his Groundbreaking research and remarkable contributions to the field, Dr. Chu has revolutionized the realm of industrial engineering 
particularly in the areas of sustainable infrastructure and renewable energy. His, his relentless pursuit of innovative solutions has not only demonstrated exceptional academic prowess, but also exemplified a commitment to addressing pressing global challenges. Dr. Chu's pioneering work has propelled the boundaries of engineering knowledge, inspiring future generations, and establishing him as a prominent figure in the field of industrial engineering. His remarkable achievements and visionary insights make him a deserving laureate of the esteemed Severino and Pasco Lectureship Award for Engineering. Congratulations, uh, uh, Dr. Chu, uh, Anthony, and please uh, give him a round of applause. Of course, our will award the <laughs> I will personally pick up the trophy in the United States after I obtain my visa next year. Thank you, congratulations. And, and uh, I also uh, requested uh, President Mario uh, that the 1000 uh, prize will be donated to the Philippine Paase. Uh, fun, uh, fun, gen, uh, or revolving fund. And we agree that the money will go to uh, the uh, 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 grantees from the uh, uh, grad map speech, those who are applying for graduate uh, school come next uh, academic year. And similarly, from the Dr. Smell and, uh, and Dr. Sabado, uh, the uh, uh, contributions, the donation went to that particular uh, fund. So thank you so much, and again, congratulations. Thank you. Yeah, we had uh, 17 uh, grantees last time, uh, and we'll report. We haven't received the full report, but many of them have accepted into graduate school, not only in the US, but in Australia and Europe. So, thank you.